Hello everyone, my name is Wilfried Thuy. Today I'm going to introduce you the concept, the structure and the philosophy of Biomod 2. My presentation will be followed by three other presentations. The first one by Damien Georges will introduce you how to run Biomod with examples from a single species modeling perspective to multiple species perspective. The second one by Maya Giga will introduce you more advanced settings of Biomod especially, for instance, how to run future projections. The last one by Yann Ondo will introduce you the Shani interface of Biomod. As you have seen the last few weeks of your month, there are several algorithms out there. They are just a non-exhaustive list. But as you can see, there are generalized additive models, linear models, ordinations, classification and regression trees, or even boosting evolution trees, bagging averaging, such as random forest, artificial neural networks, or the well-known point process model called Maxent. From all these models, the key question is this, which is the best? Which one I should use? Is there any model better than the other ones? How could I compare them in a comprehensive framework with the same data? Should I use them all together and then make an average, an ensemble prediction? What is the uncertainty associated with the use of one single particular technique in respect to the other ones? There have been a lot of comparative analyses that have been published the last 15-20 years. They have compared non-parametric to parametric models, machine learning to non-machine learning models, presence-absence models versus presence-only models. The most comprehensive one was published by Genelis in 2006, where they compare a large range of different models. As you can see here, for instance, from this graph, you have on the x-axis the area under the curve and then the y-axis, the correlation between the presence, the observed data, and the probability of occurrence. If you're on the top right corner, means the models are very good. If you're on the down left corner, means that the models are much less good. As you can see from the, from the figure itself, maxent, boosting regression trees, generalized dissimilarity matrix model are, seems to be a bit better than the more traditional GAM or GLM or MARS model. What they, can, what they concluded from this paper is that non-parametric models seem better, like GAM, Maxent, GPM. And they were better than ID complex ones, such as neural networks, for instance, or genetic algorithms. And again, obviously, better than parametric ones, such as GLM or discriminant analysis. The thing is that they were not always the best, not for all species, not for every situation. And we should always remember that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So again, it doesn't help us to choose which one I should use for my case study. So where do you go from there? We need for a platform to perform quick comparative analysis and the same set of species and remodel data. We need also a platform that to allow averaging predictions to decrease the uncertainty and generate confidence intervals. And we need a software to propose several purpose modeling alternatives. Everything now can be coded in R, so that's obvious that Biomod have been developed with R. And Biomod is a suite of modeling techniques which have been pre-programmed in R, so it's not a we didn't do it ourselves, and what we did is more like additional handy functions around it. The thing with Biomod is that it allows to run several models, several evolution procedures for an unlimited number of species in a consistent setting. So how does it work? What's the structure of Biomod? We obviously need species data. Could be presence and absence, could be presence only data. We also need environmental data. You have seen the last few weeks or the last few months how to generate these environmental layers, 
from raster data from polygons. They can be categorical variables to a vegetation type, soil pedology, or they can be continuous climatic data, for instance. Then you will train different algorithms that we just that will, I will present later. And by the way, we have nine different types of algorithms. Each one, since it's already coded in R, has its own diagnostic method, like ANOVA, out-of-back selection, cross-validation. All this model will give you a probability of presence for a given species. Then what you can do is to run several evolution methods. Here I'm just listing three, but we have much more in biomed. There is the area under the rock curve, there is a Kappa statistics or the true skill statistic for the most well known. From with this model, with these methods, for instance, you can also translate, transform the probability of presence of the models into presence and absence prediction. From that, since you have run several models with the same data, you can run any type of comparative analysis that you would like to. You can also run some biodiversity assessment predicting the species of a space and then maybe if you are modeling several species to look at species richness, if you have traits, if you have phylogenetic trees, you can also look at different facets of biodiversity where they could be of a space. If you also want to look at what could happen to the future in function of different climate change scenarios, then you can generate also the probability of presence of the species into the future transform it again into presence and absence prediction using the same metrics and then also still do this biodiversity assessment. Obviously, I mean, it's, it's useful to run several type of algorithms in biomod, but it's also useful to run several type of GCM or several type of climate change scenarios when you want to make future projections. So again, this is something that is very easy, handy to do in, with biomod. It means that you can generate several probability of presence and predictions across the different RCP scenarios, for instance, and then run multiple biodiversity assessment, and as we say, to have also an uncertainty assessment to look at how large is the variation when you predict into the future in respect to different type of algorithm, in respect to different type of climate change scenarios, in respect to different type of climate models. Biomod was originally developed in 2003 under the S Plus platform. I guess not everyone knows this very old fashioned now, old fashioned platform. But then in 2005 and 6, I recorded it in R to make sure that it's openly available and it can be uh, much more widespread. What type of data could be used in Biomod? For the response variable, it can be species presence only data or it could be presence and absence. We can model an unlimited number of species. Obviously, the main limitation would be your computer or the cluster of computer you are using. Obviously, you need a minimum number of observed presence because then that's a bit useless to run any statistical relationship between a single presence data and environmental variables. In terms of explanatory variables, could be continuous, could be ordered, could be categorical environmental data. A priori, it's unlimited, but it's much better practice to retain a limited number of uncorrelated variables and also, importantly, meaningful variables. The usual recommendation we do is to between 2 to 10, it could be 15, obviously, it could be 3, 4, or 5. You can check for normality. But then also, I think the most important point is to make sure that they are ecologically meaningful. So think twice before selecting the environmental variables you want to put into the model. In terms of format, in terms of how to do that, Damien will present you that right after my presentation. Then let's go to species occurrence data. If you get presence and absence data, then there is no initial step needed. You can just simply put your data 
in presence and absence format into PyBot. If you have presence only data, like herbarium data or point occurrence data, then you need to create to, to, yeah, to create a set of pseudo absence data. Why? Because most of the models implemented in Biomod require presence and absence data. In Biomod, there are four methods for selecting creating pseudo absence data, which are implemented. The most common way of selecting pseudo absence data is to randomly sample a large set of localities across the study area. Since the geographic or the environmental extent over which these pseudo absences are sampled also have been shown to potentially affect model performance, we added the DISC strategy. The DISC strategy set a minimal and a maximal distance to presence points for selecting the pseudo absence data. That way, if there is any sampling bias in the presence only data, then the pseudo absence data will kind of follow this bias and it has been shown to be a good alternative strategy. That will be the user to decide about this minimal and this maximal distance. The third way of selecting pseudo absence is to use prediction from a preliminary model. So this one will be surface range envelope, where then the pseudo absence data are selected outside the surface range envelope prediction. So the idea is that you run the surface range envelope for one or two variables that create some kind of predictions, presence and absence, where the species could occur. And then you select the pseudo absences outside of it. However, this approach has the disadvantage of amplifying the bias if, if, it present, if it's present in the initial species data. Finally, the last strategy implemented in Biomod is that the user give the pseudo absence data that he wants to use. So all these methods will be um, presented in more detail uh, in Maya's Gegin presentation. Obviously, when you start selecting pseudo absences, comes the question: How does the the choice of the pseudo absence selection influence my model? Indeed. Different sets of absences or pseudo absences will lead to different model parameterization and predictions with an associated uncertainty. So, in Biomod, what we did is to code the possibility of repeating the pseudo absence selection several times. So, it's, it's coded. You can just say, well, I want to, to draw 10 times the pseudo absence selection. The model will be run 10 times on different sets of pseudo absences. The good thing is that it measures the influence of the, the pseudo-absence selection. It gives an ensemble of predictions for a single model across different sets of pseudo-absence data. However, this is computationally intense. Every model is rerun several times. And it asks for a complex data, complex data story. And by the way, we are not using data frames, but we are using three-dimensional or even more um, three-dimensional arrays. So instead of having one single prediction per model, you have, for instance, several repetition, different models, different sites. In terms of model runs, every species is going to be modeled iteratively. So you model a species after each other, or in parallel using a grid system. Each model, or each algorithm, is run iteratively for each species. We start by the GN, then the GAN, then the random forest, then Maxent. Each model has the form I want to predict the presence or the absence of a species in function of a set of environmental descriptors. Each model will be then stored as an R binary object. It will be evaluated, tested according to different strategies. Each model will be used to predict the observed data, and each model will be used to project the potential distribution in space or time. Then, each model has its own goodness of fit measure. As I explained a bit before, the GAM or the GM, they have their own ANOVA um, diagnostic functions. Same for the other type of models. When it comes to the predictive accuracy, 
predictive ability of the distribution model or the habitat stability models. There are several ways of doing that. First of all, you can use, you can perform the model evaluation on the same data that I use to calibrate the model. It means that I'm, evaluate, I'm calibrating the model on 100% of my data and I evaluate the models on the same environmental data. This is obviously not a good practice. If your model is overfitting, you have a very high predictive accuracy, but then there is just no way your model is going to is going to make good predictions when you predict over space or time. So somehow let's say that it's prohibited. The alternative is to model is to run the evaluation and a random subselection of the initial data that are not used to calibrate the model. In other words, you partition you randomly split the initial data in two parts. The first one for calibration, the second one for evaluation. That's very convenient, but you need to make sure also that the species prevalence is constant. It means that if I have 20% of presences in the calibration data, let's try to make sure that we have 20% of presences in the evaluation data. A bit like the, present, the, the, the same idea than the presence and abs, uh, the pseudo absence selection, for instance, Multiple runs are recommended. And then you never know if this one single random split is going to influence the model. Or maybe a, a single model versus another one. So you need to run it several times, at the cost, obviously, of time. The last alternative is also to model, to do, uh, do a model evaluation on independent data. So if it happens to you to have independent data, it could be different year or it could be different uh, sampling strategy, different system, then try to use it. It's probably the best approach, obviously, but are there truly independent data? Not only that is sure. Let's now summarize the overall modeling strategy of Biomod. We have a single species to model. We have our set of carefully selected environmental data that we want to fit with a single algorithm that will give us a single prediction. Let's assume that we just have presence only data. Then we need to select pseudo absences that we also used for making two uh, sub data sets, one for training, one for testing. We just we still have a single prediction. We have seen that it's better also to generate several test and testing data sets. So if you done that, if you do that 10 times, then you will end up with 10 predictions. We have seen also at the beginning that it's also better to generate several sets of pseudo absence data. So then you start to have multiple predictions across several sets of pseudo absence data, several sets of training and testing data. In Biomod, you can run also several algorithms. So then you will generate a much larger range of prediction than a single one at the beginning. Actually, what you obtain is a range of prediction for a given species. If you have, or if you want to project into the future, you can also have a range of climate change model, a range of emission scenarios, and then maybe different time horizons. Then when you run that across Biomod, you will end up with an ensemble of predictions per species. Running so many predictions generates some issues. The most important one is data storage. It creates a hell of data. So in Biomod, actually nothing is stored in the R workspace when we try to actually store the data in the hard drive. That's a bit more time consuming because R doesn't like to write on the hard drive, but at least it's free up the memory. And we use also multiple arrays to store all the information across species, across several presence, and pseudo absence selection, for instance, multiple training and testing runs.
There are nine modeling strategies that are implemented in Bilot. I will not go into the details of any of them here because I will assume that you have seen them in textbooks or they have been seen across the course during the last few months. However, I will recommend you to have a look at the book that we published with Antoine Guizan and Nick Zimmerman where all these nine different modeling techniques are introduced and they are developed with our uh, scripts and codes. I also suggest you have a look at Curry Merrow's paper on simplicity and complexity in distribution model where any of these, all these techniques are also presented. I'm actually using, you'll see a bit later, the figure from Curry Merrow's paper uh, into the presentation of the different modeling techniques. The first modeling technique is surface range envelope by a claim. The first species distribution model that was developed in 1991 by Busby to predict plant distribution in Australia. Bioclim defines the ecological niche of the species as the n-dimensional bounding box that encloses all records of the species in the environmental space defined by the n preselected environmental variables. And the figure here you can see the minimum and the maximum of the maximum January of the maximum temperature of January. You can play with the, to remove a bit the effect of the extremes, you can play with, instead of taking the minimum and maximum, taking the 5% and the 95% quantile. Next, we have the logistic model, the generalized linear model that everyone has seen in any textbook. It's fully parametric, and then in that particular case, you can decide whether you would like to have a linear, a quadratic, or a polynomial response of the species to the environment. In Biomod, for instance, we have a stepwise selection of variables, so you can play whether it's linear or quadratic and then let the model decide for you. The next one will be the extension of the logistic regression in the additive uh, framework, the GAM. The main advantage of GAM in respect to GLM is that you don't have to predefine the response. In other words, it's completely data-driven. For the use of splines or loss function, it will mimic the relationship of the species to the environment. Then you can play with the complexity of the spline or the loss to make sure that it doesn't follow too strongly the data to not over-parameterize it. Next, we have the multivariate adaptive regression spline, which is somehow in between the GLM and the GAM. Indeed, instead of using a predefined shape, such as a polynomial function in GLM, for instance, mass fits piecewise functions with knots that together can accommodate nonlinear responses. So, in this sense, it's quite similar to GAM and the smooth functions. To select the number of knots, usually, I mean, most of the implementation of Mars in R use generalized cross-validation to assess the effect of adding or removing nuts into the, into the estimation of the curve. Finally, the last uh, regression type method is Maxent, or point process model, very si similar to a GLM. I guess you have seen it uh, through the course, so I'm not going to go into the detail. We are using exactly the Maxent implementation that you have seen in the that you have seen in the standard uh, package. Then we have more the classification type methods. The first one is the well-known classification tree analysis that repeatedly uh, partition the predictors into different categories suggested by the data. Then you can play with the minimum number of observation in terminal node, the maximum node death, and all these things. All these things can be selected usually through uh, cross-validations. Then we also have mixture discriminant analysis. I guess you all know linear discriminant analysis, but the only problem with uh, linear discriminant analysis is that it assumes that linear combinations can be used as a classifier. Whereas most of the time when we assume from niche theory that are more the response of species follow a, a bell-shaped curve, for instance. So in Biomod, we use an extension of that. We use the mixture discriminant analysis that use mass, this piecewise regression that we just said before, 
uh, to implement nonlinear relationship. Finally, we have the methods that implement somehow a mixture between classification and machine learning methods. The first one, boosted recursion trees, is very interesting because it's, it's a forward stage-wise procedure that iteratively fits simple trees, very simple, two or three nodes, to the training data, while gradually increasing the focus on poorly model observation. And it's done by fitting residuals to the same predictors again and again. Things to play with, usually that's the number of trees, the learning rate, or even the size of the tree, which represents somehow interaction. So if you want two-dimensional interaction, two-way interactions, just set a size of tree to two, for instance, or three, but add more. Then every, all these things can be learned through uh, cross-validations. Then we have artificial neural networks. The beauty of these uh, tools is that they can accommodate nonlinear relationships between the response variable, species, and the explanatory variables, which make them highly suitable for modeling highly complex systems. They can model any type of explanatory variable and do not assume any normal distribution of the data and are said to be robust to collinearity, for instance. Things you can play with uh, in Biomod or with R, it's the number of hidden layers that represent these very um, nonlinear responses. The last model implemented in Biomod is Random Forest that builds multiple trees. And each of these trees constructed and bootstrap samples of the data and using different subsets of the full predictor set. The thing that you can play with is to control the complexities through the number of trees. The larger the number of trees, probably the better will be the prediction. So you can use 2,000, 3,000 uh, trees to build the random forest. The advantage of running nine different models within Biomod using exactly the same data is that you can represent them all together and to pinpoint differences between predictions of the different models. As you can see here, for instance, the overall prediction is rather similar between the different models, but it diverges a bit in different places, usually around the boundaries of the species distribution. Obviously, how to compare these methods, which one is the best, which one is the less, the least reliable, would be to use different evaluation metrics. In Biomod, there are several evaluation metrics which are implemented. Here, we just present the main ones. Uh, the area on the receiver operating characteristic curve, the rock curve, the CAPA statistics, and the true skill statistics. They are the three uh, most well-known ones, but we have uh, two or three other implemented uh, evaluation metrics in, in Biomod. Usually these methods are also used for um, transforming the probability of recurrence into presence and absence data. So for instance, that could be done when minimizing the number of false absences and the false presences, is what we call the ORAC threshold. It can be done also finding the, the best threshold that maximizes the capacity statistics or the TSS statistics, usually using the uh, testing data. You see in Maya, Maya Gigan's talk a bit more explanation on these different strategies. When, usually when we predict species distribution, one thing that is of interest is to know which variable drive the system, which variable is the most important, the most influential for explaining the distribution of the species. So each technique in Biomod and in R got its own criteria, like an ANOVA for GLM or GAM or out of back selection for boosting regression trees. But it's complicated to compare them across different models and to extract the relative importance of each variable in a multi-model run. If we have run GLM neural networks, they don't use the same criteria, so it's quite difficult to compare the relative importance of the variables. So to do that, Biomod offers a measure, a metric, a variable importance that is independent of the technique. 
The idea of this variable importance in biomod is that once you have built your model, you can make a prediction. So that's your baseline prediction. Then what we do is to, let's say that we want to estimate the influence of variable one. So what we are going to do is to randomize variable one, make a prediction with this randomized variable one and the other ones are, not, are untouched and then compare them. So we are going to compare the prediction, the true prediction, and the prediction when variable 1 is randomized. The results are very easy to understand. If the correlation is 1, that means that the variable 1 has no effect on the mean prediction. Obviously, if the correlation is 0, that means that the variable 1 has a huge effect on the prediction. So to summarize what is built in Biomad is that you are going to do this variable importance once or several times. We should recommend to do that four or five times. It's probably not needed to do that 10 times or 100 times. I mean, four or five times is enough. And then we extract the mean, or actually one minus the mean of the correlation to measure the importance of the variable. And here, for instance, you have an example for the nine different models for a given species with different uh, variables. You can see, for instance, that for variable 3, the importance of the variable is quite consistent through the different type of model. That means that you are pretty certain that variable 3 strongly influences or drives the distribution of the species. What's interesting is that then you have some inconsistencies. That means that for some variable, like the variable 6, is important according to neural network or according to GLM, but absolutely not according to GAM. So let's show that maybe if you want to discuss a bit the importance of this variable, you should be a bit more cautious. Another advantage of uh, running multiple models is that then you can also look at the uncertainty. There are several types of modeling uncertainties, and the first one that you probably all know is to look at the residuals of a given model. So if you assume that you have the probability of presence of a, of a model, here it's coming from a GLM, you have the probability of presence. Then you can also extract the residuals of, this, of, the, of the prediction and look where the residuals are quite negative or are quite positive, and it's where you know that the, the, the model is probably not necessarily wrong, but there is a high uncertainty in this parameter estimation. If you think about the pseudo-absence selection sets that we detailed a bit earlier, it is a bit the same. You can look at the variation across the different runs of the pseudo-absence selection. So here, for instance, you have 10 runs of the GLM with 10 different sets of pseudo-absence selection. So that's the prediction, and then obviously you can look at the average prediction, where you just average. Simply, it's not weighted by the um, evaluation metric, but you could. Here's just an average of the prediction. Once you have this average, you can also extract the standard deviation. And it, again, uh, it pinpoints areas where you know that there is some kind of variance that are especially due to the presence and absence selection. More than that, then you can look also at the intermodal variation. As we have seen, you can look at the prediction from different models for a single species. So here you have an example. You can see that in general, that's more or less the same prediction, but there are differences. Again, you can look at the, the mean prediction. Again, it's not averaged by the accuracy here, the predictive accuracy, but it could. But you can also look at the variance, the standard deviation across the different models. And again, we can also pinpoint areas where you know that there is high uncertainty given the models that you use. In other words, when, it's, when the, the, the standard error is very high, that means that the different models disagree on predicting the distribution of the species in that particular pixel. 
obviously then you can look at the total variance just by the sum of the variance for instance when you have intermodal or the influence of pseudo absence selection and then uh, estimate where uh, there are probability of presence which are the most unlikely uh, to be true given the model or given the pseudo absence selection. So that's the overall beauty of this type of approaches, whatever it's in biomod or in any type of uh, package. But running multiple models is essential to make sure that the estimation that you get is not only due to the modeling technique you use, but it's independent of that. And then you can also investigate the uncertainty around that particular choice. Over. Now I will let uh, Damien and Maya and Jan to present some basics of Pymod with our codes and a bit more examples, some more advanced techniques, especially how to run single versus ensemble modeling, and then the very beautiful shiny Pymod interface that Jan Ondo has coded recently. Thanks for your attention.